I begin with Seamus Haney's poem, The Cure at Troy, which recalls the latter days of the Trojan War, really the end of the Trojan War. But rather than look at the entire story, I want to look at the final lines of his poem, which are quite famous, mostly because of their secondary resonance with the Northern Ireland conflict. Haney says, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and history and hope can rhyme. History and hope can rhyme. The Iliad is a poem, as, the, as we hope we have, the history is a poem that I hope we have seen lasts, that its resonance really speak to the conflicts that are cyclical, not just within the poem, but throughout our lives, that war seems to be almost an unavoidable in human history. And poets such as Homer, and of course in the 20th century, Seamus Haney, are examining what this means for human beings. And rather than find tragedy at the heart of things, both these poets end in hope. And so I want us to keep in mind this ending of Haney, and justice can rise up and history and hope can rhyme as we're reading, looking for these moments that hope and justice rise up within the poem that we're reading. Poets have an ability to bring the mundane or the historical or the empirical and rise them up to a new level. One of the ways that this is accomplished in Homer's poem is by the intervention of the gods. I want to look at the gods. If you're not familiar with them, you should probably read a book called Edith Hamilton's Mythology. This was a book that was very influential on me when I was in eighth grade. I think I read all of the different gods and goddesses stories. I actually plotted them. I may have illustrated all of the characters and tried to keep track of the various gods and goddesses. They were endlessly fascinating to me. We have a parallel in C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy in which he was endlessly fascinated by the Norse gods and Norse myths. For some reason, these divine characters, these characters that are larger than human beings and yet are so unlike our Christian understanding of God, of the triune God that we see in the Judeo-Christian scriptures, what, is, what are these gods doing? What, are, what is their point? Who are they? Why are they in this story? And why are they even called gods when they seem so unlike a god you could actually worship or believe in? The gods in Homer are not meant to be believed in, argues Eva Braun, who was a professor at St. John's College for 50 years. She taught Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. She has a wealth of wisdom on the gods in Homer. But she makes the point that they simply are, that they just exist. It is not even up to the believer to question them. It doesn't even matter if you recognize that they are there or not. We'll see throughout the poem that Homer's Hector actually doesn't care <laughs> much about uh, the interventions of the gods and the prophecies of the gods. He is always asking questions about whether or not the gods will favor him or not favor him. So he knows that they are there, but he doesn't know which way they're going to side. He'll give offerings to Athena at the same time that the Greeks are giving offerings to Athena, as we've already seen Athena intervene on behalf of Achilles. So who the gods side with seems rather arbitrary. There is a hierarchy of the gods. You can't see this image too clearly, maybe on the, the right half of your page. But at the top would be the first gods, Kronos, which means time, and Gaia, which means earth. You have earth and time meeting, and thus the gods are born. The gods were not always there. They were created, but they are ageless, and they are immortal. They will neither age, nor will they die. There's a hierarchy in the sense that some gods came before others. Some gods gave birth to other gods. So we have lots of gods and goddesses being brothers and sisters, 
being parallel in power. So we have the three top gods of Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Those are the three most powerful gods that divided the universe between them. We, of course, can think of Zeus as the god of the heavens. Poseidon is the earth shaker. He's the god of earth and water. And then Hades is the god of the underworld. So we have the three different levels. They divided up the universe between them. So we do have those three mighty gods, and then we have their siblings or their sons and daughters underneath them. And we'll see the ways that these hierarchies play out. Zeus will act as the pinnacle above even Poseidon and Hades, asking all the gods to submit to his will. In the opening lines of the Iliad, we have, and the will of Zeus was accomplished. We do have a sense that Zeus is the most sovereign and the most powerful of all the gods. Unlike the Judeo-Christian God, though, we do not have gods that are omnipotent, omniscient. They are not all powerful. They are not all knowing. There are many things that they don't understand, and they must submit to fate. They will constantly refer to the things that have been fated as an end. It does seem like there are events that can unfold differently up to that end, but ultimately that end has to be accomplished. The walls of Troy have to fall in the 10th year of the war. How that will happen, how the gods and the humans will intervene until that point, that's the reality TV show for the gods. That's the let's see what happens here, right? This is the unknown adventure for the gods that they actually look forward to. They love to meddle in the lives of humans. They are ageless and immortal, and therefore they would be incredibly bored if they didn't have human beings to watch and interact with. The, human, the humans know certain things about the gods. They know that the gods can appear in disguises, and sometimes these humans can actually see through the disguises, even when the gods and goddesses do not want them to. There are ways of spotting goddesses and gods. At the same time, Sometimes people don't know if it's a god or a goddess that they're fighting. At one point, you'll see Diomedes in his Aristea, and Aeneas from the Trojan side will say, should I go and fight Diomedes, or do you think that that's a god and I should beware? When we get to the Odyssey, you will see Odysseus pretend to think that Narcissa is actually a goddess. Maybe she's Artemis, and he, he better mind himself because she's the virgin goddess, and he should approach slowly and cautiously. The gods are superhuman in the sense that they are ageless and eternal, but they eat and drink just like human beings. They fight. They actually seem quite petty in many of their arguments and disagreements. They have sex. You'll see Hera seduce Zeus in one of the most prominent episodes in book 14 of the Iliad. And they sleep, they rest, they, they lack attention. They have moments where they take naps and don't pay attention to what's going on. Again, book 14 will be a, a prime example of this. Overall, what Eva Braun makes note of in her book, Homeric Moments, is that the gods are living lightly. They don't have skin in the game, so to speak. For the gods, it doesn't matter necessarily whether someone lives or dies, a city falls or stands. These are things that are just passing constantly for them. They do seem to get into passionate fights about it in their own interest for these cities, but there's not a lot of weight to the fight. If Troy does not fall, it would not really change Hera's life. She talks as though it would, but it wouldn't. Whereas if Hector falls, it does matter to Hector. It matters quite a bit to Hector. It matters to Achilles whether he dies. Death brings a significance to events that the gods just do not have. They don't have that kind of risk involved in the events in history. And therefore, they can act differently. They can intervene based on who they want to pick at that day or at that moment, who, want, who they want to love, who brings them the greatest sacrifices, who who brings them the mightiest prayers or most humble prayers, and, and they get to choose these things. And so we'll see throughout the story that both the Trojans and the Greeks are praising and worshiping the same gods, and the gods are intervening on different sides, uh, very much dependent on their own wills. Here is Caroline Alexander's translation, the translation I will use most of the time throughout these lectures. Wrath. Sing, goddess of the ruinous wrath of Peleus' son, Achilles. What we see in the opening lines of this poem, 
first we have the emphasis upon Menon, upon the wrath of Achilles, which will be the predominant theme of the poem. And the question we have to ask is why? <laughs> why sing 24 books of poetry, what ultimately would have taken three days of performance about the wrath of one singular individual? What was so ruinous about this wrath? We hear that it inflicted wounds, oh woes, without number. But look who it inflicted woes upon, not the Trojans. It inflicted woes without number upon the Achaeans. The Achaeans are on Achilles' side. So within the first two lines, we already see a problem. Achilles' wrath does damage to his own people. He is hurling forth to Hades many strong souls of warriors, but it doesn't say which side. In some sense, it shows that his wrath is going to be disastrous not only for the souls of the Trojans, but also for the souls of the Danaeans or Argives or Achaeans. They are called several different times, different names. And rendered their bodies prey for the dogs. We also begin to see that there is a distinction between bodies and souls of warriors. This will come up throughout the story. We'll have Patroclus's body being fought over. We have Patroclus's soul coming to visit Achilles when he doesn't bury his body because then his soul cannot go on. And the will of Zeus was accomplished. The divine sanction of these events, that these events were meant to be and were carried out to be by the gods who intervened. And then the opening, what causes this wrath? The wrath is caused by two men in conflict, Agamemnon and Achilles. And how did this conflict begin? As I mentioned, we have the key themes, Manus, Time, Kleos, and mortality. Manus is the Greek word for wrath, we have Achilles' wrath being the singular element in the poem, and we want to unpack why that is and what this means for the story. Uh, for modern audiences, this probably sounds very strange. We're going to read an entire poem about a guy who got angry, <laughs> but we have to look at more what this anger signifies. What is the cause of his anger? Is it worth getting angry over? And is the anger really the passion that should be for life that instead directs him and others towards death? Time. Time does not have a singular translation into English. It can mean prizes. It can mean tangible things. And from these tangible things, we get the sense of honor. That who has the most prizes has the most honor. Those words mean the same thing within the Greek context. Time being prize and honor together. So we think of Time as the tangible things, where of course modern audiences would not normally think of honor as being a tangible thing. Kleos. Kleos is a difficult word to translate because it has four different meanings in Greek that also kind of signify the same thing together. Kleos is a story, it is fame, it is honor, and it is glory. It is not the same kind of honor as Time. Time would be the tangible sign of that honor. Kleos would be the kind of intangible, right? It is the story that someone tells about a person's glory or fame or honor. It's the reputation of that person. It's what will last about that person after they die. And so here we have mortality. Kleos is the option of being immortal. You're immortal in story, fame, glory, and honor. Someone will talk about you forever and ever, even after your mortal flesh has ceased to exist. And that's where we have an understanding of why it is that Achilles is so angry. Look at this opening statement that he makes to Agamemnon. The two of them are fighting over Briseis. Now, when most modern readers first are introduced to the conflict between the son of Atreus and the son of Peleus, between Agamemnon and Achilles. They are very confused because it seems to just be over a slave woman, which is not a great beginning to an epic story, right? At the same time, it also has its parallel in the fight between Menelaus and Paris over Helen, again, 
over a fight for a woman and what actually began everything, which was the fight between Poseidon and Zeus over Thetis, which was solved by marrying her to Peleus. And then Eris throws the golden apple and the whole story begins. So we have something is happening here. If the fight between these two men over this woman, it must have, if it's being repeated, it must have greater meaning than just two men fighting over a woman. So what is the greater significance of this? Well, as we will begin to see throughout the poem, it has greater significance because Achilles has been fighting for this woman. Not in a real sense as she, he went into the war in order to retrieve her, the same way that Menelaus actually went to war to retrieve Helen. But there is no other reason for Achilles to fight. Within his Greek culture, he fights to receive Tame, Tame and Cleos. If Tame is arbitrary and it's removed from him, then why would he keep fighting? He has no fight with the Trojans. As he tells Agamemnon, they've not offended me. Helen is not mine. If we win the war, I do not get Helen. I do not get those possessions. And actually, if I fight more victoriously than you fight in the war, I still don't receive as much because you're the lord of this fight. You are the lord of men, right? The king of kings in this battle. So Achilles is doing the lion's share of the fighting, but in this moment, his lion's share of the prizes has been threatened. And instead, Agamemnon is taking his prize, his teame, his honor, in front of all of these men. And it leaves him without a reason to fight. If he's only there to receive Timae and the Timae can be taken away, then what is the point of fighting? Why are they there? And this, of course, becomes the question of every war. C.S. Lewis said somewhere that when you go to fight overseas, you're not fighting for a cause. You're not fighting the Germans. He had no beef with the Germans. He was fighting to protect the person next to him. He was fighting to defend those around him, that that's what you ended up fighting for. The reasons that people go to war have to be significant enough to continue risking their lives. And at this moment, Achilles realizes that everything he was risking his life for, his one and only life, has now been threatened.